All right, let's get started. Um, my name is Laura Bernhard, and I'm a senior researcher at California Competes. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar to explore collaborative strategies for expanding work-based le learning opportunities for students. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get into the discussion. Um, if you have any questions during the session, you can click on the Q&A icon located on the control panel and submit your question through there. We'll answer whatever we can via that function and then hold relevant questions for our panel for the latter part of the webinar. And we will be sending the recording to all uh, registrants following the event, and it will also be posted on our website, californiacompetes.org. Um, so I'd love to begin by learning more about who joined us for this discussion today. Um, so we're gonna open some poll questions for you all. The first question is about the sector that you represent. Um, so if you can select that, student, early care, K-12, higher ed, employer, and industry and workforce development. If you selected higher ed, we'd love to know what, what your role is, um, faculty leadership practitioner. And then the last question, um, we just would love to know to what extent your institution or organization is currently engaging in advancing career readiness for students? So I'll give you a few seconds to answer those questions. Um, and just watching the answers rolling in, we have a lot of higher ed folks, a uh, bunch of staff members, this is great. Um, and then in terms of the extent to which y'all are focusing on career readiness, um, it looks like a lot of you. So over half are sort of, you have good practices and partnerships established or expanding those. Um, so that's great. Um, so for those not familiar with California Competes, um, we aim to solve the state's most pressing social and economic problems by conducting rigorous higher education and workforce policy research. We use that research to guide decision makers in designing and implementing solutions that strengthen our economy and help our communities thrive. We view higher education as both a vaccine and an antidote against economic stagnation and social stratification for individual Californians, our communities, and the state's economy. We believe long-term economic growth for California will be accomplished through shared prosperity. To do this work, we focus on four main policy priorities. The first is aligning higher education and workforce to build stronger relationships and better pathways for students to well-paying jobs increasing college access and success for adult learners, especially those with some college no credential who, as you may know, uh, number over 6 million people in our state and are a key part of the solution to meeting California's workforce needs. Employing effective online education to make our state's post-secondary system more agile and accessible and coordinated policy setting and implementation so that we are using data to make informed decisions, evaluating efforts, studying outcomes and helping our state leverage its size and strength to improve the lives of all Californians. For today, um, first I'm gonna share a little bit about the project that this work is based on. Um, it is known as the Los Angeles County Second District California Community Colleges Career Ready Pilot. Uh, that's a mouthful, so we refer to it as LA2CCC. And then we're briefly going to share an overview of our new memo, highlighting key issues and promising practices from this work. And then we're going to have a conversation with members of our panel to explore strategies and challenges around expanding paid work-based learning opportunities for students, which was a real priority for our partners in this project, 
and how cross-sector partnerships can strengthen pathways from education to employment. At the end, we'll do some Q&A uh, with the panelists and, and invite you all to participate in the discussion, and then I'll wrap things up. Uh, so first, really, why is advancing career readiness so important? Um, currently, California faces a shortage of college-educated professionals to match economic demands. Meanwhile, colleges are experiencing declines in enrollment and students are having trouble transitioning to quality jobs after graduation. In the face of these challenges, identifying and fostering a culture of career readiness as a cross-sector responsibility can help. Higher education institutions boost college enrollment, competition, and students transition into good jobs. Local government uh, promotes community health and vitality through a thriving economy and strong workforce. And employers gain access to a skilled workforce to support their bottom line. To this end, LA2CCC brings together senior leaders from Compton College, El Camino College, West Los Angeles College, Los Angeles Southwest College, Supervisor Holly J. Mitchell's office in Los Angeles County, and California Competes. Um, and throughout this, we sought to foster career readiness as a shared responsibility, adopt a regional approach to align with the local and regional structures of labor markets, build institutional capacity, and improve career opportunities and outcomes for the residents in Los Angeles County's second district. By strategically weaving career readiness across students' post-secondary experiences, these colleges can provide students from underserved backgrounds with clear pathways from education to employment, leading to su successful transitions into meaningful careers that support their ability to engage in, contribute to, and thrive in their communities. In the discovery phase, we interviewed 49 faculty, staff, and administrators from the four campuses, as well as representatives from the county and external partners. We then wrote memos for each of the college partners and a cross-partner memo that included observations and recommendations for how to address some of the most pressing challenges related to career readiness. In the implementation phase, we focused on developing a partnership between the colleges and the county to work together to better serve the residents of the second district. This included a full day retreat last summer where we gathered representatives from four colleges, the county, DEO, and the supervisor's office to brainstorm activities they could take on as a collaborative. And we've continued to support that work this academic year, highlighted by multiple employer convenings last fall, um, which you can see in our pictures. And based on our work over these last two years, we've released an insightful memo highlighting the lessons learned and promising practices that emerged throughout this collaborative effort. You can access the memo by scanning the QR code on this slide or going to the noted link. I'll give you a second in case you wanna pull that up right now. The memo encapsulates what we learned from the interviews we did in the discovery phase I just mentioned and provides examples from the four colleges that demonstrate what can be done to improve career readiness in the region and offer a roadmap for colleges and county governments to guide future efforts. We organize our findings into key, six key recommendations. The first is to communicate with students early and often about career readiness. This was a recurring theme across our interviews that conversations around career readiness need to begin early in a student's academic journey, even before they get to college. Engage faculty in career readiness efforts. We found that obviously faculty invest a significant of time interacting with students and polling research validates this perspective as students identify faculty members as the most valuable source of career related advice on campus. Third is to strengthen employer partnerships. Many um, participants noted that employers are critical to career readiness efforts at the colleges, even though these arrangements are difficult to create and sustain. Uh, the fourth is to promote paid work experiences for students. Um, so folks highlighted work-based learning as a key component of career readiness and stressed the importance of providing paid work experiences for their underserved student populations. 
so much so that we decided to dedicate our panel discussion today on this particular area. Next is to collaborate across colleges to better meet the needs of residents. Interviewees recognize the importance of working together to best meet the needs of residents, particularly since not every college can offer every program. And lastly is to improve connections between colleges and the county. County agencies and community colleges share the goal of boosting the local economy by helping area residents have their basic needs met and prepare for and enter high quality jobs, particularly in fields with critical shortages. Interviewees noted a, noted a desire for greater collaboration between county partners and community colleges with aims of leveraging the combined expertise and connections of both entities to meet this common goal. Throughout this work, one of the top issues that we heard from campus leaders, industry partners, and county representatives was the critical importance of paid work experiences for addressing career readiness in the region. It is critical because it provides skills and industry connections to secure good jobs and maximize students' return on their educational investment. It mitigates financial barriers to college, particularly for those from low income or underinvested in communities. And research shows that paid work experiences offer greater advantages to both students and employers than, than those that are unpaid. Because this is such an important topic, not only in LA's second district, but across the state, we thought it would be useful to, divide, to dive into some examples of promising practices and to ask for advice from those who are steeped in this work. And luckily we have a great panel here today to do just that. So I'd like to start by introducing our moderator for today. Um, Dr. Keith Curry is the president of Compton College and CEO of the Compton Community College District where he is responsible for overseeing all departments and functions of Compton College and the district and guides strategic planning efforts to create educational opportunities for students to complete their desired personal, educational and professional goals. And he's a great friend of California Competes. Keith, welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm excited to be here and in the chat that has more information about me and also about uh, my social media and handles. But I'm really excited to be here today to be a moderator for the panel. Uh, before I introduce some of the uh, the panel members, the, the panel members today, I just want to just share a couple of words that I have. Uh, first, I do want to say thank you to California Competes. Uh, we started the journey a couple of years ago, just trying to understand at Compton College how we can improve uh, workforce development and assist our students as relates to uh, workforce. And not looking at it from a current technical education perspective, but looking at it from a whole college perspective. And what that means is that when I first assumed the role as CEO of the district, I was so focused on workforce development, but really looking at career technical education and not looking at the whole college. And California competes through their work has been able for me to broaden my perspective regards to workforce development and really looking at all, um, all academic areas of the campus as it relates to workforce development and linking our students to jobs. I'm also excited about being here today with my colleagues from the other participating community colleges as a part of the partnership, but also representation from the uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, the reason why I think it's really important in regards to partnership with Los Angeles County, not only is Compton College the first community college uh, in the history of California that has a, a specific data sharing agreement with the county to share information in regards to CalFRES, but we've been able to create partnerships with LA County as it relates to workforce development. I'm really excited about our work with the Department of Economic Opportunity as it relates to our uh, health professionals partnership that includes California State University of Vegas Hills, uh, includes St. John's Community Health, also includes uh, Kedron, Health, Kedron Health, and also includes Community Plan School District and Charles Duke University. But the county has been involved in these conversations from the beginning, which has been very helpful to our college as we really try to look at different workforce development opportunities for our students. So partnerships are important. And I would say as a, as a firm believer in partnerships, partnerships is about relationships. And it's important that as you enter into partnerships, you look at as you enter into a relationship with the organization or with the uh, organization or with the uh, employer and making sure that we uh, build that relationship, but we also maintain that relationship. My fear all the time with the partnerships is that people look at the partnership as a one-time interaction. And it needs to be ongoing, but also too, we have to value each other's time in this work. So partnerships are important and there's clear examples of how partnerships have worked, 
but it always goes back to the relationships between the individuals within those organizations. That And this provides me with the opportunity now to bring the panelists. Uh, we first have Jose Anaya. Uh, Jose is a really, uh, a really for me, is a, is a phenomenal individual. I remember when I first met him when he uh, arrived at El Camino College. Uh, he oversees the El Camino College Community Advancement uh, Division and Business Training Center and also has the college apprenticeship program that combines classroom instruction with online, with on-the-job training to help people prepare for skills careers. So thank you, Jose, for being here today. Also like to interview, uh, also like to introduce uh, Tiffany Miller. Uh, Tiffany Miller has worked in uh, community college workforce development programs for the past 10 years, where she currently serves as the Dean of Apprenticeships and Workforce Development at West Los Angeles College. Welcome, Tiffany. And the next person I'd like to introduce is Carolyn Tarosis. I think Tarosis. I think I said it right. I'm mean, I, I was working on this all day too, and I, I know I messed it up. Uh, Carolyn holds the position of senior deputy to the second district supervisor, Holly J. Mitchell, who is my favorite LA County supervisor. Not just because she represents us, but she's our she's my favorite for economic and workforce development, where she serves as governmental affairs attorney and workforce development expert for the County of Los Angeles. And these are our panelists. So I want to start this off with a question for uh, all of our panelists to start. Uh, and, I, and I'll start with uh, Jose. I have you go first. Uh, but I want all the panelists to ask this question. What do successful paid work-based learning opportunities for students look like? So I, I've got two examples for you. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's really forming a partnership with the company. Um, and the, our first, exa first example is with Northrop Grumman. Uh, basically, we've been working with Northrop Grumman for over seven years. Uh, we've developed an apprenticeship program with them. And our students basically are recruited for, from career technical education programs on campus. Uh, they're recruited into an internship, summer internship. And they basically spend eight weeks at Northrop Grumman. During those eight weeks, they actually work alongside technicians and engineers, gain valuable experience. And then what Northrop does is they interview those students to go into an apprenticeship program. And depending on what occupation, it's basically either a two-year program or a four-year program. And what Northrop says is basically that eight-week internship is an eight-week interview. And so uh, our students during that eight weeks are really, um, they get to know the company and the company gets to know them. Uh, we also partner with the South Bay WIB on this where the students actually get interviewing skills, prepare resumes in preparation for that interview and that apprenticeship job, uh, as well as the South Bay WIB provides uh, stipends for our students. Uh, at the end of the eight weeks, they actually do a presentation in front of Northrop Grumman management on what they learned during those eight weeks. And I'll tell you, uh, when we recruit these students, typically around this time, uh, there's an overwhelming uh, response. And typically we get over 100 applicants for about 20, 25 slots. And so uh, I'm excited to be partnering with Northrop Grumman. Uh, they're a long-term partner. And we're starting to branch out into other departments at Northrop Grumman. So this partnership is really growing just because of the success of both our machining and electronics programs, uh, apprenticeship programs with them. The other uh, model I wanna throw out is our partnership with the Department of Defense. Uh, they provide funding for us to actually place interns at small defense companies in the area. And those students actually are placed at these defense companies and they work with a faculty member to define a statement of work. So in other words, the companies that we're working with, uh, they've been funded by the Department of Defense to uh, develop uh, basically a small business innovation research grant, develop some technology important to the Defense Department. And so our faculty members work with the company and basically put together a, a statement of work for the students to work through during their internship. And I'll tell you that program, basically what we're finding uh, is uh, 
many of our students, about 92% of our students actually get job offers from those small companies after they complete the internship. And so those are the two examples I'm throwing out to the group. Okay, perfect. Th thank you, uh, Jose. Let's go to Tiffany with the same question. With the same question? Yes. Um, yeah, similar to what Jose... Jose used to be my boss, so I learned a lot from him. Uh, I used to work at El Camino, now I work at West. Uh, so yes to everything he said. And uh, we know what works. And then the, our job is to scale and create as many opportunities as possible for our students. Well, at the same time, uh, when we're working across different sectors, listening to the different needs of industry and doing what's best for them and also what's best for our students. So, for example, Jose mentioned the intern to hire model um, at West. We do that, but we also have apprenticeship programs where the students are hired on their first day of their work experience program in our apprenticeship programs and other partnerships. And that's because our employers don't want to wait. They said, I really need someone now. I'm willing to hire them now. I would love for them to be trained at the same time they're working for us. So we listen to our employers and then we set up the training program uh, based on the skills and content that that student needs to learn to be successful in their job. So Curlin, Curlin, what does it look like for you? What does successful paid work-based learning opportunities for students look like to you? Sure. Um, so I'll just preface this by saying, um, you know, we represent the second district. Uh, I hope everyone here knows what that is. But if you don't, it's about 2 million people, everything from Culver City all the way down through South and Central Los Angeles, uh, Carson, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach. So we have a very wide and diverse uh, group that we represent. And we also have a lot of employers in different industries. But to, to us, to the second district, what's important is quality jobs. So we are not going to start any sort of um, either discretionary money that the supervisor is going to use or leveraging of county funds, which I'll get to um, and how that's important if the jobs are not quality jobs. We want to start with worker voice and worker dignity. How do we make sure that these are going to be opportunities for folks to be able to advance and thrive in careers? Um, and then how do we make sure that we're working with the specific employers that we've identified to create customized training programs that meet their needs, while at the same time meeting the needs of uh, the students and, of course, the workers. And so to us, what that looks like is what was mentioned, stipends have to be a part of any sort of program that's happening. Um, if we're doing a program where someone has to have uh, a 30 to 40 hour a week training for eight to 12 weeks, they need to be compensated for that. They can. It is not reasonable or equitable to expect that folks are going to leave their families and potentially try to advance their careers if they are not going to be uh, earning while they're learning. Um, and then secondly, I think what's important is that we have the employer bought in from the outset. So what we've done in several different programs that we've worked on at the county is we bring in the employer at the beginning and we say, what kind of skills and abilities are you needing? And how do we design a training program with the community college that meets your needs? So uh, there's something in, in the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act called customized training. Um, we actually as a county can pay for that. Um, and then there's also a lot of funding that we're leveraging from the American Rescue Plan, uh, where we are actually giving folks stipends um, to be able to participate in those customized training programs. And then additionally, I think what's really innovative, uh, we've launched what we're calling a worker equity fund that's flexible cash assistance so that when folks are in these training programs, if they have uh, a transportation issue, a childcare issue, a tools and materials issue that they need to be able to, to pay for quickly, uh, they're able to do that. Um, I'm happy to talk about some specific industries, industries that we are targeting right now, uh, center around information technology. Uh, we have a lot happening with our Delete the Divide initiative, which I think Dr. Curry is, is very familiar with. Uh, we're, we are actually getting folks paid not only internships, but permanent jobs in the tech and IT industries. Uh, and then we are also focusing on healthcare careers. The county itself is actually the, the largest health and hospital system in the county. How are we training folks for county jobs? Um, how are we training folks for certified nursing attendant, medical assistant, et cetera? And how are we leveraging the allied health career um, tr training programs at our community colleges to train folks up for those jobs uh, in our county health and hospital system? So I'll expound on some of that as we get further, but to me, that's what success looks like. 
you, you know, Curry, you, you said something that I, that I, I want to make sure we highlight a little bit more is, especially I see this a lot too, when I hear from employers and also community groups that want to hire our students, people want to hire students to work for free, right? right. Not understanding that the students have other financial obligations and you're asking them to do something for free when they can be able to get a paid opportunity with other agencies within Los Angeles County. And it bothers me because our students are turned down those opportunities because mm -hmm. they're not paid. And, it, mm -hmm. and people believe it's a good thing. Oh, you can work, it's good to have the hours. People gotta pay for food and housing. They have other obligations and we gotta meet the students where they're at. Right. Absolutely. Yes. And again, Supervisor Mitchell will always talk to you about equity. Who do you think are the people that can afford to work for free? It's the people who have privilege. Um, and we need to make sure that we are normalizing compensation, period. And I'm going to leave it there because that you can't respond to that. It's just that's just facts. Let, let me throw out the second question I have for the entire group. What are the keys to ensuring that experiences are successful for both students and employers? Let's start with Tiffany on this one first. Great. So the most important thing uh, to set employers and students up for success is to be very transparent and very clear about what the expectations are for the students and the employers. So for example, Jose mentioned Northrop Grumman. Here at West, we also work with a variety of companies like JPL, and students will hear the star name. They're like, oh, I want to do that. And they may have an idea of what they would be doing. So not all entry level jobs or internships are going to be working on a rocket ship or doing that exciting thing they have in their mind. So it has to be really clear what is going to be happening at the internship for both the student so they know what they're applying for and both the employer so they know that the work, what they're going to be getting. So that's very important. The second thing is that there has to be a clear understanding of what happens when the student is at work for both the student and the employer. What are the decision rights? What can they make on their own? What does the employer need to be checked with before they do things? What do they do when they finish a project? Who do they check in with? Who does the employer go to if they're having an issue with the student coming on time? It has to be really clear that everyone has support to manage the work experience at every step of the way. So there has to be a plan for all of that could happen during that work experience time. And there needs to be structured evaluation points and opportunities for feedback for both the student and the employer so that everyone can get the support that they need to be a successful, you know, maybe the uh, employer hasn't mentored a student before, so they may need some pedagogical ideas or different ways to talk to students if they're struggling. The student may want to talk to their supervisor about something they want to do, what's the right way to the pro approach that, so there has to be opportunities to express that. Um, and it has to be really clear start dates, end dates, compensation, what's expected, uh, how to call out if you're sick, what do they do if they're doing a good job, a bad job, just so that everyone's clear and no one will be surprised whether it's going really well or whether it needs improvement. Perfect. Yeah, so to me, um, and sorry, I got distracted because there's a, a question for me in the chat here, but for me, uh, in terms of success, we need to set expectations at the outset. Um, the models that I'm talking about and, and referenced in my previous answer are specifically this, this customized training. Um, I want to give everyone an example. Uh, before I came to the supervisor's office, I actually was the director of economic and business development at our workforce agency. And we had a specific partnership with Proterra, which was a electric vehicle manufacturer. And they said, look, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to come here, or expand here unless we know that we have a quality talent pipeline. So what we did is we worked with another community college closer to their factory, and we actually designed a curriculum and we did that with the employer. So the employers need to be familiar with the curriculum. They need to be familiar with the training. They need to sign off on that training. Um, and I think that you, at, you know, with community colleges, workforce systems, and employers, everyone should be working together to figure out exactly what it is that needs to be part of the training curriculum. Secondly, I think what's really important is to do um, appropriate pre-screening. So I think there have been a couple of times where I've, I've participated um, both on the su supervisor's end as well as as a practitioner where you're sending the workforce system or the community college system is sending dozens of folks to employers uh, for training programs, but they haven't been appropriately pre-screened. It's going to be a better 
uh, experience for everyone if we are matching the right talent to the needs of the employer. Um, and so everyone has expectations set correctly at the, at the outset um, in terms of needs. So I would just say that that the workforce system and the colleges are only as credible as the talent pipeline that they're able to produce. Employers are going to come back and want to continue working with you it's, if it's a positive experience and there's a quality talent pipeline. Um, so we just need to be clear on, on what the needs are and make sure that we're meeting with students and with job seekers in advance to figure out if we have the right match. Jose. Well, I think they kind of covered it all. The only thing that I would add is I always look at making sure that the student gains something from the internship. And I'll give you an example. With uh, Northrop Grumman, they do such a wonderful job in developing these students during the eight weeks that if they don't even, if they don't get picked up by Northrop, some right. other company will pick them up. And that to me is, is, is a wonderful experience for the student. Even if they didn't get the job, they'll get a job someplace else just because of that experience. And I, I do agree with the selection criteria. I think that's key too. Uh, I'll tell you with both our internship programs, we do have a very competitive selection criteria and that really puts our best foot forward because those students that really want to do a good job are the ones that end up getting those internship uh, slots. You, you know, there's a question in chat and I'm, I wanna, I'm gonna go to it because it was part of my next question anyway regards to the Learning Online Employment uh, Program that provides funding to colleges through the California Student Aid Commission, which provides opportunities for students to have uh, career-based uh, opportunities. It could be with a nonprofit or, or a, a profit or employer, even with public colleges and also public schools. Jose, you want to share anything about what El Camino College is doing in that space? Yeah, we're actually taking our funding and hiring a dean of workforce that basically will help our students get jobs in the community with these companies. And uh, the, the late funding is great because that really helps incentivize these smaller companies that may need that extra boost. And so with the late funding, uh, uh, those companies can get some subsidized uh, employ employment and our students will uh, basically end up getting those jobs. And so I'm excited. Uh, we just started uh, using util utilizing those funding and once our dean comes on board, I think we'll kind of start doing that to scale. Yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting uh, perspective, or an interesting not I won't say perspective, but an interesting approach by El Camino College to utilize those funds uh, regards to staffing and to really build out uh, some work workforce opportunities mm -hmm. for students and utilizing these funds to be able to do that. I think it's really creative, and it's I'm really interested to see what happens uh, with this new position. So, Keith, can I add a, a, sure. an additional point? We already work with the South Bay WIB to actually provide on-the-job training for our interns and apprentices. So, you know, partnerships matter. And so with the South Bay WIB, we're already doing that. But with our late uh, money, we could expand that and really scale it. And I, I'm interested to see how that goes. Let, 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 me, uh, let me throw a question out directly to Tiffany. What advice do you have for colleges that are trying to find resources to help students, support students with paid work-based opportunities? Are there different resources that can be branded together? Yes, um, absolutely. This is a great time for workforce development. There's a lot of money both in the state of California and the federal government that's really pushing workforce development initiatives that offer paid work experience. Jose already mentioned one key partnership for us as community colleges is working with our local workforce development boards. There's a lot of federal funding and state funding that comes through WIOA, different types of WIOA, WIOA OJT. They have different funding sources depending on the sector. So building those partnerships with our local state government and ag local agencies are very helpful to find out what funding is even available. Oftentimes I'll go to my workforce board, I'll just tell them what I'm doing and they'll say, I have a funding for source for that. Oh, that's a great idea. We can go after this grant together. So partnerships are key with um, accessing funding. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there's a lot of paid internships already available. So sometimes we'll think, oh, I need to create a paid internship. But if you do some research just based on what's already available in your region, you may find many companies offer paid internships for students 
um, that are your students. And so it's just about connecting our students, understanding the application process, how scheduling meetings with those companies, how can we make our students competitive candidates? And in my experience, when I've done those meetings, they're all very excited for our students. Many companies right now are very interested in diversifying our talent pipelines and our community college just have very diverse candidates. So I found that uh, to be very positive. The other thing is, uh, we've already talked about it, but we can explore resources that we have within our colleges as well. So we can practice kind of what we're trying to do outwards. We can also do that inwards. Who are our students that are already receiving uh, work experience dollars through financial aid and just need a really good opportunity on campus? They could work with us, for us, um, doing what they want to do based on their program of study. Um, and then also just talking, I would just say, talk to as many people as possible, somebody's neighbor. It's really all about networking and finding out what opportunities and funding is already out there and how we can connect those with our students in our colleges. Let me move to a question for Carolyn. What advice do you have for colleges that are looking to partner, partner with the county or to ensure that students take advantage of work-based learning opportunities through the county agencies? Well, first, the county, sorry. Yeah, no, I, first of all, I would encourage anyone who is either an, an employer or a practitioner or a, a representative from a college to email me um, because we are always looking for more partners at the county. I will let you know, again, I can't overstate this enough. We have funding um, from a variety of different sources to help subsidize some of these employment opportunities, first of all. So we have on-the-job training, which was mentioned. Uh, we also have some pretty innovative programs with our, our Department of Economic Opportunity, which Dr. Curry mentioned at the outset. And I think there are some folks from our Department of Economic Opportunity here, but I really do want to give them a shout out as they're the ones doing the work day in and day out. Um, we have what we're calling Youth at Work Elevate. Um, so if you have any folks that are at your colleges, again, this isn't going to be everyone, but uh, 16 uh, to 24, we can provide up to 400 hours of paid work experience. And we've actually been able to, to leverage that very effectively um, with an organization called latech.org. Uh, they have a, a board of tech CEOs um, in that are homegrown in the LA region. Uh, and they're, the CEOs of these tech companies are looking for talent and they're looking for talent from diverse communities. Um, so we've actually been able to help get folks hired um, into these tech companies because they're able to do a training program first. Uh, the county through some of our, our dollars, we are able to pay for part of that training. Um, and so the employer pays for some and the county pays for some. It's, it's you know, you try try the person out and then there's an expectation that with that training, um, that person's going to be hired uh, at the end of their internship. Uh, so I would just say that we have that, like I mentioned before, we have um, different customized training programs that we're doing in other sectors, health, uh, the green economy, life sciences, tech, uh, the creative arts. We have a film and digital media program. So we have a lot of different industry specific programs that we're working on. And I would really encourage, especially the colleges that have um, really quality training programs uh, and curricula in um, these high demand industries to, to contact me, contact us. Let's let's work together more effectively because I do think I'm going to be honest as someone who worked in the workforce system. There's a little bit of a silo um, between the workforce system and, and Dr. Curry obviously is has talked about how he's breaking that down, but there is a little bit of a silo between some of the colleges and the employer partnerships that they have and then the workforce system and the employer partnerships that they have. And how do we make sure that we marry those two um, and that we're meeting on an ongoing basis so that, um, you know, our office, Supervisor Mitchell, our county departments know, um, you know, what you're doing and the, the latest advances in the different curricula that you're building out um, so that you know what employers we're working with and what they're looking for um, so that we're all on the same page and that we're able to get the best opportunity for the students. Um, I would say that the workforce system has really moved towards what they're calling high road training partnerships. I think if that's not a term that everyone's familiar with, definitely it's a term that's being used at the federal and the state level around workforce development. Um, so really incentivizing funding for quality employer partners. And so we want to get folks, especially folks from communities that have been overlooked or unfinished into those quality jobs. Um, it should not be just because you know someone that you're able to get into an industry. It should really be about um, having that opportunity 
uh, to experience something that you wouldn't have otherwise had the opportunity to break into. Um, so I, I just think that we need to be meeting together more uh, often as colleges, workforce, and elected officials. Uh, we hopefully can are starting that here and continuing that. I think we have a great paradigm for what we've done in the second district, thanks to California Competes. Um, and I would just ask anyone who's on here, make sure that you're coming to us so that you can help us leverage that on the job training, the youth at work dollars, the, the county employment programs that we're working on to get people into public sector employment, et cetera. Um, and I'm happy to put my email address in the chat if it wasn't already. And, and so I want to come back to Carolyn. I, I want to come back to a question that you made, statement you made about silos. But I'm going to ask a question first to Jose, and then I'm going to come back for the group to answer the question in regards to breaking down silos. Jose, what advice do you have for colleges that are looking to establish stronger relationships with industry partners? What is most important in establishing and maintaining those relationships? So for us, it's really about bringing them into our ecosystem or our family. And so I'll give you an example. Uh, when our faculty work with the company to develop the internship uh, programs and also mentor the students as they're going through the uh, internship, our faculty learn and are able to bring that back to the classroom. So it's, a, it, it's kind of a two-way street. Uh, we also like to bring them into grant opportunities, actually go after grants to strengthen the partnership, fund some of this, the work that we're doing. And in addition to that, uh, we invite them into the foundation to give scholarships. And so we really bring them in and try to develop a deep partnership with them uh, and with the understanding that uh, for us to succeed, they succeed. And if they succeed, they hire more of our students. So it's a win-win. Uh, the other thing uh, is we like to invite them into our advisory, CT advisory committees, so they could help us develop and continue to improve curriculum to make sure that the students that are graduating through our programs have the skill sets that are needed in industry. So I want to ask a question, and there's a couple of audience questions, uh, participants' questions I want to get to as well. But currently mentioned about silos and uh, how it's important that we break down some of these silos within this work. What are some of your thoughts? Do you do you see the silos? that are happening between industry and colleges, or what can, what can we do to break down these silos? And it's open to anyone that wants to try to tackle that. I mean, I, I'm happy to jump in. I think that, you know, I was even talking with our partners in the workforce system yesterday about this specific question, because I was just saying, you know, like, look, I don't want to be the talking head for the entire system when we have hundreds of folks that are in across the entire county who are working on this, but I would say that there's definitely a feeling that the county workforce system and the community colleges could be meeting maybe on, and I know there are lots of different meetings, and it's like, what is the right table to convene folks so that we're kind of uh, all aligned um, and sharing those best practices? Uh, it would be great if we had some sort of quarterly meeting. I know there have been iterations of that um, but it seems like it needs to be like a coalition of the willing to, to come and to meet and to share information and opportunity. I would just say that, um, you know, we have a pretty robust network of employer partners. Uh, we have employers who are coming to Supervisor Mitchell's office often, and I'm going to be completely honest, I'm the workforce deputy, I'm usually sending them to the workforce system, but it would be great if the workforce system and the college system um, were all Excuse me. Excuse. Me. Ooh, sorry. Aligned. Uh, and who we're approaching, how we're approaching them, what kind of training they need, and then also, I think I I hear, you know, oh, there's a new bio biotech life science curriculum that's out. There's a new allied health curriculum that's out. Like it would be great if um, we we were all aligned on the same page about that, about what training opportunities there might be at the colleges, so we could go directly to work with the colleges. Um, and then I just think continuing to build that relationship uh, because we have a lot of folks with high, high barriers to employment who are probably also a lot of your clients in the, I don't, I don't want to presuppose, but I think uh, students in the community college system, we uh, definitely have a lot of support services at the county that we can leverage to help support those people uh, while they're going through their learning journey and employment journey. Um, and I just think that we're not leveraging all the resources together in the same place. Jose or Tiffany, would you like to touch touch on the, the silos that you see within this work? 
for me, uh, I came from industry. So I actually worked in industry for 17 years and I recognize how busy they are. And so uh, for me, when I approach an employer, I, I recognize that their first priority is to get product out the door. Uh, the last thing they want to do is attend meeting after meeting after meeting to get to a solution. So for, for my interaction, you know, I like to figure out what we need to, to deliver right away as opposed to dragging it out for weeks or months at a time. And I start to recognize how to solve their problems really quickly, get to a solution and deliver that solution to them, but work with them to do that, um, communicate, building trust. And I think the point uh, I want to end with is trust. You know, if you do, if you say what, if you deliver what you say you're going to do and they recognize that they'll come back and it's a win-win if we create value both ways, but it starts with trust. Jose, I truly believe that regards to partnerships, you have to have trust and you have to follow through on what you say you're going to do, right? And that to me is critical because we in this work, we need to work together. People need to be able to depend on you in this work and understand that you will follow up. Uh, Tiffany, you want to add anything? Yeah, I think I'll just add um, yes to everything that was already said, but it's a it's a people operation. So it's a it's a people to people business. We sometimes don't think of ourselves as customer service providers, but we all are, especially when we need to work together. The question is, what can I do for you and how can you do something for me? And is it appropriate to work together? So I would just not give up. I know sometimes for me, it can be daunting trying to work with the county or trying to work with the workforce board or trying to work with the state. There's so many numbers on the website. You've tried to call, you, you can't get through it. I just wouldn't give up because once you find the right person, which it will happen eventually, then everything will start coming together. Then they'll be like, let me help you. And don't get discouraged if someone transitions and then you have to start over. It really is the long game because we have our students in mind. We have our workers in mind. We really want what's best for the people that we're working with. And so it it really is work. It, don't get discouraged to stick with it. And with enough patience and nurturing and relationship building, we'll build those partnerships that we need. And, and Tiffany, I appreciate you saying we're playing the long game, right? That is, nothing's going to happen overnight. Uh, that's why, for me, relationships are important because we're playing a long game in supporting student success. And remember that it's going to each year we can continue to plug at this work. There was a there was a question in the uh, in the Q and A, and it, it said, "What are the best sources to use and access when looking for paid internships?" And I put a slash apprenticeships that are mm -hmm. that are already out there for students, or for just for individuals in general. If somebody's looking for an internship or opportunities, where should they go look for that? I think that's part of the problem, right? Like you, at least on my end, if so, I, we encounter students every day that come to the supervisor's office asking for help. Um, I know our workforce system does. And unfortunately they kind of have to be in the pipeline uh, to access one of these paid work experience um, opportunities. I don't think that anyone off the street who's going to search on like Indeed is gonna be able to figure this out, um, which is why I think the partnership between the colleges and the, and the workforce system are important. I know that you all have uh, paid experiences as well, but I just, um, you know, we could, I candidly, I think we could make it easier. We could make it better and more effective. Um, but back to my point about the pre-screening, I think people need to express that they're interested um, and express what they're interested in so we can appropriately match uh, the student or the individual uh, with the right opportunity. There are a plethora of opportunities right now because of all this federal uh, recovery money um, of, of different funded industry specific apprenticeships and training programs. And I would just encourage again, um, folks to reach out to us so that we can help you and your, your students uh, get into the right place. Um, I would also just, there are a couple of questions, Dr. Curry, about like how we pay for this and how much people are compensated um, during their uh, with their stipend. I don't know if it's okay if I could answer that right now, but uh, I just wanted to let folks know um, it's typically equivalent to like a minimum wage. Um, and in the programs that I've done, folks usually get paid once a week, um, you know, depending on how many hours they've completed. Uh, but it's a little bit specific to the, the individual internship and also who's administering the stipend. So what we do is we go after grants to pay for internships. 
And typically we write into the grant that we're going to pay the students $20 an hour. It seems to be a, an easy number to work with. Um, but we also work with companies that pay uh, for internships. And I'll tell you, um, it, it's really hard to find. They're kind of hidden in plain sight. And, and what I mean by that is nobody advertises them, at least th that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, and so it's an individual company uh, conversation. Do you have paid internships? And I'll tell you, some of them do, but not for community colleges. They typically have them for the four-year institutions. And so we pose the question, can you open it up to community colleges? And uh, we've had a few say yes. Great. And I'll just add, um, this is a really exciting time. You know, the internet is getting better and better. Um, don't underestimate a quick Google search looking for paid internships in animation Los Angeles or paid internships in construction Los Angeles. Um, that's a great way. Sometimes, you know, if we're looking for a sector where like, we really don't have enough partners, we'll just even see and we'll be amazed by all the things that are already available out there to our students. And that's with us not having to do any work. And then we just learn about them. Then we can promote them to our students. And so for people, I always say, come the community college, it's free to apply. You get a student ID number. You can make an appointment with a counselor. You can go to our career center. It's a great way to learn about all the resources because that's how we organize them. We post them on our online job board. We send them to students and alumni that are enrolled in different classes and majors. So a community college could be a good touch point for someone looking for opportunities. And I, just, oh, I just want to really quickly plug one thing. We uh, at the county have really focused on life science and biosciences. We're building out LA County um, to compete with San Diego, San Francisco, um, Cambridge. Uh, and we have uh, we have a paid uh, bioscience apprenticeship program called BioFutures. I put the link in the chat, but I'm not sure that I'm able to um, provide that link um, to all of the attendees. And if we could do that, that would be great. Just in, in case you have folks who are interested in life sciences, we really are trying to get um, individuals uh, from underrepresented backgrounds and those are full-time paid um, internships. If, and I do apologize, we're running out of time and we have other questions in the chat. So we'll try to get back to individuals later, at a later date in regards to some of our responses to those questions, but we are limited in regards to time. And I do want to say thank you to our panelists for their time today and sharing their insight as it relates to this topic. Uh, it was very informative to me, but also I know it's very informative to the uh, to our attendees today. So I want to say thank you very much for, for your participation and also for providing your insight. And now I turn it back over to Laura to be able to close this out. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Keith, for moderating. Um, yes, and as Keith mentioned, if there are questions we were not able to answer, uh, we will do our best to follow up with you. Um, my email is on the slide um, and we encourage you to download the memo and reach out if you are interested uh, in this project or in any of our other projects. Um, we would love to connect with you. You can find us on all of the social media platforms um, and please keep in touch. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great day.